checking my connection. Apparently, I am live now. Uh, coming to you from the outskirts of Bendigo, regional Victoria. Not a bad place to be right now. Uh, hello all, Ricky here from the Australian Guitar Show. I'm very excited to be having a chat very shortly with Remy of Garcia Guitars. I'd actually really only kind of uh, connected in with Remy's stuff of recent. Uh, I'd seen him uh, doing some stuff quite a while back and then because I took that little bit of time off, um, you know, when, as I've kind of come back in, I've seen him posting some new stuff and he's just doing some really cool builds and and um, so just through a couple of quick conversations, we, we kind of teed it up that Remy would be the second person to have a chat on these combos. So I am now going to add uh, Remy in. Do, 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 do. Garcia Guitars. Uh, joining very shortly. G'day to everybody who's slowly joining in here. It's good to see you all. Bill Gold Guitars. We've got... Uh... Hey, Remy. How are you, mate? Ricky, how are you? Yeah, Great very... to see you. Yeah, you too. You too. Um, that's good. That's <laughs> four eyes. That's a good start. <laughs> I can see and hear you, so this is that's a really good start. Yeah, yeah. Most people prefer to just do neither seeing or hearing of me, really. So, ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cool. I, pl I plugged these earpieces in earlier, and and uh, there was no sound coming through, so I was a little bit concerned. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that that kind of creates a bit of a worry. I, I only yeah. run them because I need I need to obviously keep the juice going in my phone and, and I need to write down little uh, little notes as people kind of make comments and ask questions and so forth and um, oh yeah absolutely so sorry if my sound quality is not quite as good as yours <laughs> it's great to see some uh, some family signing in there as well friends oh, cool. so who, who's welcome to the Garcia Guitar you? Workshop. <laughs> Who's that, uh, Julia Corson, I can see there, which is my mother-in-law. Oh, hello. And then uh, Latin guitarist is uh, Nelson Mansilla, a yep. friend of mine. Awesome. I can't see any other names scrolling through there just yet. Yeah, they'll slowly, uh, they'll slowly kind of get on board and find where we are. So that's good. Um, hey, so wh whereabouts in Australia are you, mate? <clears throat> in Brisbane. Oh. Sunny, sunny Queensland. Land of the free. And um, yeah, <laughs> I kind of feel like um, the the partition here between us is the invisible border. It makes me <laughs> between 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 states. If we try to cross over, we'll actually kind of get beaten up. So just be careful. Yeah, <laughs> it always reminds me of like a Brady Bunch thing, you know, where I should be looking down, going, oh, you know, like that. <laughs> uh, um, Oh, mate, it must be, uh, yeah, it, it's, yeah. you know, I'm not going to say I, I, I'm jealous because, you know, we are where we are and, and I'm very blessed to be where I am right now. So does that, but um, I, I wouldn't argue about being up that direction right now, I tell you. Indeed, yeah, we have had it really, um, really good, I think. We're lucky to be here mm. with um, such wide open spaces. I think this potentially, and all the sun, sunlight, that's potentially how we've, um, you know, dodged a bullet there with COVID, so. No doubt, no doubt. With yeah. There's a bit more sunshine, that's, you know, that's, that's, yeah. that's kind of just a bit of a given, so, yeah. So you, yeah. you're in Brisbane itself, or what area in Brisbane? Uh, Tarragindi, so, yeah, 15 minutes south of the city. Yep. And um, neighbouring suburbs, uh, Maruka and Holland Park, and it's um we're we're fairly close to the um Tui Forest, which is near Griffith University. Yeah, nice. Um and it's a beautiful area. It's um there's a lot of um bird life and trees and carpet snakes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah, so we were up in uh, northern New South Wales uh not that long ago. Uh would have been late June, I suppose. And uh yeah, carpet snakes, just these big two-metre carpet snakes just wandering around the roads, you know, in between people's gardens yeah. and stuff like that. It was just amazing. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, they're pretty snake. wild. Yeah. Never never had any troubles with them. No. Nah, but, um, yeah. 
Very cool. Fortunately. So, mate, your your um your guitars. As I, I did a quick little intro there, just saying that it's it's kind of only after taking a little bit of a break um, from from doing the page for a little while. Uh, you kind of like sprung back into my attention recently as I saw you making some posts, and uh, you, you're just making some really beautiful stuff there. So, thank you. How how far back does it go for you as far as getting into making guitars? Like, how did it start for you? Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. I've uh, my father was always into uh, restoring furniture when I was a kid. And uh, he was a house painter by trade and, and doubled in a lot of the trades within the building industry um, while he was there. And we had a workshop set up at home. So mm -hmm. I was actually, um, you know, working in the workshop with dad from the age of about six years old. Wow. And, uh, you know, it's a funny thing that um, dad laughs about, you know, but he took me into the workshop and I was too small to actually push a handsaw. Um, I didn't have the strength to push one of these full length carpenter saws. So he gave me an electric jigsaw instead. Yeah, right. And all I had to do was switch it on and, and spin it around, you know, like, um, so a bit of a dangerous tool to be giving a six year old, but that was kind of a good start for me. Um, Pre was building guitars. Pardon? Pre-OHNS days, of course. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, yeah. Um, I guess uh, back in 2009, as a furniture maker already, uh, I started building guitars. And the, the first book that I bought was uh, Making Master Guitars. Mm -hmm. And um, just found it incredible. I'm not sure if anyone's um, seen the book before. Some of the guitar makers would know it. Um, it's a bit of a Bible, the, the old Spanish tradition of guitar makers and of guitar making. So it describes the building process and probably half a dozen famous makers, mm -hmm. um, Antonio de Torres and similar builders. And... Um, so I made my first guitar that way, and it, it took about nine months to build, gestation period. <laughs> um, and and uh, I still have that guitar here. I, you know, I would never sell it. And um, when Nelson dropped over yesterday, um, he, he was talking about classicals, and I was like, oh, here, look, you know, I'll just dust this off. Have a look at this. And, uh, yeah, he loved it. He... he um, he had a bit of a play around on it and um, really could appreciate that old traditional style of building. Yeah. So um, did the video which you just posted? Uh, well, no. Um, oh. In fact, the, 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 the video that I posted of Nelson was uh, playing my most recent featured guitar, which oh, cool. is the Tiger Model guitar, an acoustic OM. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I um, thought maybe it was one of the same. I hadn't had a chance to watch it yet, so I was like hoping I. Could yeah. No, that's cool. Go and have a listen uh, later on when they're not listening. Yeah. But um, so with that first build, uh, did you have any other guidance other than the book, or you? I mean, obviously you were quite skilled with woodwork, being in the furniture trade. I yeah, I was fortunate in that sense that. Um, I, uh, I was less concerned about the, 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 you know, learning the process of woodworking and more focused on uh, how to um, work with the sound and the tone, you know, the, the timbers, um, trying to understand what tone wood was and, and how to extract different sounds out of them. So I kind of started straight into that, didn't know what I was doing and... Um, you know, when I finished that guitar, I brought it around to quite a few guitar players in Brisbane and, and um, said, look, it's the first one. What do you think? You know, tell me. And I kept doing that over the years. So that was back in 2009. And each time I finished a guitar, like it was one to two guitars a year. And um, I would just, I would take them around to the same people, find new people, sort of growing the audience as the years went by. And, um, and always asking for honest feedback mm. and, and learning from those, you know, from, from the feedback and uh, always pushing myself to improve. 
what I'd done previously. So, well, that's a great way to do it. I mean, it, it seemed to work for for Mr. Fender as he did it that way. You know, he spoke more to the to the real world players. You know, to get that. Yeah. Feel, you know, <clears throat> you you with your journey with Tone Woods. Where did you start with that guitar? What what woods did you use on that guitar? Uh, it was very much um, timbers that were available to me. I was working for, um, at the time, uh, an antique reproduction furniture place. So um, we had a, a catalogue of um, Australian antique pieces, which were all built from silky oak. So Northern Cardwellia Sublimus. And... Um, I, Basically, the, the soundboard ended up being Western Red Cedar because I wanted something that I understood that uh, Western Red Cedar would um, be more playable immediately. You know, you didn't have to wait for it to break in for a year. Yeah, right. So um, I used Western Red Cedar and I used Camphor Laurel. Yep. Um, and uh, I hadn't heard of anyone using Camphor Laurel before, but I had some really beautiful timber there with beautiful fiddle back through it. And the, the internal bracing was, even the soundboard was braced with um, northern silky oak, mm. which was, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was crazy. I mean, I, I thought, well, it's light and it's actually really strong. I'd had, you know, quite a bit of experience with it building furniture. Mm. And um, uh, the, neck was, the neck was mahogany. I got a piece of mahogany for that, yeah. um, which wasn't too difficult to source at that time. Um, but yeah, so yeah, it was, um, really, I just learned from the book in the early days, the first few years, uh, there wasn't the, what, uh, there wasn't much that I was aware of going on on the internet. There wasn't, there weren't too many books available. Yep. Um, there were a handful. Um, and I think one of the, there were probably three, you know, Tonewood suppliers in Australia, mm. um, you know, like, uh, Botany Bay, it was uh, Gerard Gillet at the time. Yeah. And um, I think Tim Spittle in Western Australia. Yeah. And, uh, and then Mount Tambourine was in its early days mm. of, of starting that business, the um, Australian Luthier Supplies. Yep. Yeah, so. Oh, yeah, 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 right. That's, that's, I was going to say, I sort of recognise that name. And so yeah. what about tool access for you then because were you set up with guitar tools or did you have to kind of set up a new workshop to do that yeah pretty much um uh so again i, I was fortunate enough dad had uh, quite a few woodworking tools and um i had um quite a few of my own hand tools from uh working in furniture making mm. and so but None of those tools were, as you know, yeah, the, the tools need to be, um, you know, quite precise and they're specific to instrument making. Mm. Um, so I had to make a lot of things, obviously moulds and jigs and things like that. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I just I, I did what I could with what I had. And, I mean, you know, any, that's what I would recommend to anyone starting out. Just you can't wait you know, at the time, even I was desperately searching around for people to teach me, yeah. uh, and there was no one. So, I, and initially, I probably thought, "Oh no, there'd have to be someone around that could teach me to 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 build." And I waited a few months, you know, looking for people. And six months probably went by, and and I uh, went, "Oh well, <laughs> let's just start this this journey." Give it a go. And well, um, yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's um. It's a, it's a, I agree with you with the, the jumping in and going for it. You know, like when I decided to build my first guitar, uh, which, you know, I, I, I started an acoustic building course uh, through a particular place that was kind of going through uh, a little bit of personal turmoil. So I, I retracted from that course. And, mm. and so I went up, but I, I decided to kind of build an electric. And, and again, I looked at the tools I had and I just went, oh, goodness you know i'm embarrassed to kind of tell people what i've got <laughs> and, like, and, and like anybody else out there on a budget you know i'm that funny buying these crappy ozito tools that i know might not make it through the build but like you're saying i had you just have to start it is that 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 taking that first step 
um, mm. and get into it. So when, when you, you, you decided on your first build, was that a nylon or a steel string? It was a nylon string guitar and um, I, the first one uh, took nine months. The second one um, was about 75 hours. Yep. So um, I was familiar. The second one was exactly the same build, but I used traditional timbers. I thought, oh, let's see what happens. Yeah, right. Um, it was a spruce top with um, Indian rosewood back and sides. Nice. And um, a mahogany neck, and I sold that one straight away. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, yeah, yeah, to um, a friend, Daniel, a sound engineer, mastering engineer, and um, he loves that guitar. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so what was the so, tonality difference for, I mean, you know, for, <clears throat> uh, it's easy to know that they would sound different, but what did you find the different voicings between the two guitars? Uh, I, I think I found that the um, the spruce and um, uh, rosewood guitar was probably it had it had um, a good depth of tone to it, like a, a real quality, like the a very broad tonal palette. Mm. Um, but also at the same time, a very dark instrument um, tonally. So I, ch I decided, I knew that people were using European spirits and that was the way to go with um, classical guitars. But um, I'd read a few things about using Sitka spruce, which is what I did. Yep. And um, it's, yeah, it's beautiful. It, it just has um, such a kind of dark haunting sound to it. Mm. And and um, uh, quite crisp with the the Sitka spruce, the the uh, Canfloral guitar Canfloral tends to um, uh, be very um, bass heavy, like it promotes the bass frequencies. Yep. Um, and and it was a Western Red Cedar top as well, so it's quite a warm guitar, mm. and. Um, it it did have that kind of um, um, warm Spanish, traditional Spanish guitar sound to it. Yeah. Um, but it was funny, actually, um, back a, f a few years after building that Canfloral guitar, my wife uh, decided that she was going to start learning to play guitar. And um, I said, here, look, you know, just use this. And she wanted to play covers with it. Um, and it was, you know, it's fan fantastic. Like, just jump on this. It's, it's available. And, and um, uh, shortly after, a friend of ours, uh, Ruth, and her started a, a band. Uh, and they would the, – the band was called Rock Four, like the cheese. Yeah. And, um, Did they play and they would music? play – Oh, yeah, well, yeah, they, they would play covers with alternative lyrics, mm. you know, and, um, and, and Ruth had this guitar with, uh, it was like a, a Tanglewood, but uh, solid timber guitar, um, spruce top and mahogany back and sides, and it just had, Pip really loved that guitar as well, like she had played it a couple of times and um, it had a, it had really good note separation and really crisp, bright sound to it. Mm -hmm. um, for for a factory instrument, it was you know it was pretty decent. And um, so the the feature guitar that I've got on my side at the moment, which is the Tasmanian Tiger guitar, I built that for my wife. And the some of the concepts started to formulate back then, mm. um, probably eight years ago. And, um, yeah, so it was, um, it was something that over a few years as I developed my skill and an understanding of what she, she really liked and wanted that, um, I, you know, I put this together last year and, um, she absolutely loves it, you know? Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So what was yeah. that, um... What were, you, you talked about some of the ideas, guys. So you've got it there with you, have you? Mm. Nearby, yeah. I do, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah, cool. So, what were some of the things so you, I, you kind of made specific for her? 
I like the Florentine um, style cutaway. Yeah, the Florentine is beautiful. So um, <clears throat> she's, I'll hold it up like this. She's, uh, she currently has a, a shoulder injury that's still yeah. healing. And uh, so I chose an OM body size. You can probably see that there. Yep. So a, a slightly smaller, I'd been, for the last few years, I've been building a lot of Dreadnought guitars. And um, I decided to choose this size so that it was a little bit more comfortable for her to play. Mm. And um, it's also, if you can see, it's a 12 to the body. Yep. Uh, 12 fret to the body. So um, what, we've, what I've managed to achieve with that is just the, the, left hand, the left hand reach is a lot closer to the body. Sure. <clears throat> um, the bridge has moved down into the lower bound. Yep. And <clears throat> so, you know, that area of the top is, is a, a, a lot looser or you can brace it to be fairly loose. Yeah. And so um, it's very responsive. Mm. It's a really responsive guitar. She doesn't, she really doesn't have to dig in to get it to play. Like you can, you can play it really, really lightly and um, get some really beautiful, clear, full notes, mm. or you can really dig in and um, it just keeps opening up and you don't, um, you know, the notes don't break up or anything like that. Yep. Um, and so the, because she, because she likes the feel of a classical guitar, I actually made the nut width a little bit wider. It's a 46 mil wide nut. That is, that, that's, um, that's, it doesn't sound like a lot wider, does it? But once you actually put that in the hands, that's quite massive. For an acoustic guitar, yeah. yeah. For, I guess, you know, people are generally maybe more around 43 or so or, yeah. uh, you know, the really narrow necks might be 38. Mm. Um, some of the old school blues necks and stuff like that. But um, the, the fretboard radius as well is a 16 inch radius. Yep. Um, so a little bit flatter. And um, I brought the, the action down fairly low as well so that um, it would be easy for her to fret. Mm. Um, for, first fret sitting down at 0.7 mils off the first fret. Yep. And at the 12th, it's quite low as well. So it's really, um, it, you know, for, I think it's really important, especially for beginners to to have an instrument that's not only versatile, but um, quite easy to play. Like you don't want to have to be struggling with the instrument. Oh, couldn't um, <laughs> Yeah. 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 I've been um, in retail for 15 years, and the amount of times I'd have to say to parents, look, if you buy them a piece of crap, they will throw it in the corner and never play it again, you know. Like, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, you know, yeah. And most parents don't want to spend money on a guitar and blah, 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 but you just think, well... You know, you either yeah, and when, or not. But yeah. yeah, you kind of have to um, say, well, you know, buy the most expensive guitar you can afford, Agreed. you know, within reason, yeah. but yeah. <laughs> because you get what you pay for yeah, to a certain yeah. level. Um, so what kind of there, there is, sorry. Oh yeah. The poor, this, this, this lovely little uh, feature here. Um, she really loves uh, cats. Yep. Massive cat lover. We've got a cat here. And um, I dropped this in. I really wanted to, uh, for the other viewers here, you can see my fingers going straight through there. <laughs> it's um, it's a, a sound port and you, it's the first sound port that I've put into an acoustic guitar. Right. And uh, I love it. It's really, it's really an, an interesting feature. Yeah. Um, to be able to have that sounds, but even just to be able to customize little details like that. Yeah. Um, I think this, the whole, more or less the whole design of the instrument was a secret up until the time that she saw it. She knew she was getting a guitar. Yep. And um, I added this in. Um, there were very few people that knew about it at the time. And when she saw it, you know, she just <laughs> yeah. well, welled up with tears. But That's beautiful. And and that's, show a little... um, that's got a four. Oh, sorry. Oh, yes. Oh, that's beautiful. It's a, you're reflecting off the light there, so it's a little bit hard to see. But, yes, of course. But... Um, 
Yeah, sorry, as you were saying. <laughs> oh, no, no, I mean, that, I, you, you're completely distracted by that, that back. I mean, that's, that's a beautiful piece of wood. <laughs> um, so that's got a, that, is that the one with the forearm bevel as well? It doesn't. No, it doesn't. So um, I, I just heavily round the binding. Yeah, nice. Um, and it's, it actually, it's quite, it's, it feels quite nice to hold. Yeah. Nice. Um, the previous guitar that I built, the previous Dreadnought had an arm bevel on it. Gotcha. And which, which is featured on my side as well. Yeah. Um, the problem but, with mine, look at so many guitars all day. I sometimes forget. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> whose is whose? Well, no, I remember whose is whose. I'm pretty good with that. But, yeah, sometimes it just, you, you end up kind of scrolling through what everybody's built and you, go, you get overwhelmed by some of the stuff out there. It's amazing how much people Yeah. yeah it's amazing. Sorry. I, I think something about, you know, arm bevels and, um, and, and all of those bevel options for the, for the back and the waist and all that sort of thing, it's quite popular now. Mm. And um, I think uh, it's more noticeable on a larger guitar, like a jumbo or a dreadnought or something like that. Mm. But um, you know, like I've I've had uh, several uh, professional guitarists uh, guitarists play this particular guitar, and um, they all agree that you know um, an arm bevel, especially for a smaller instrument, it can be a big sacrifice. Because um, you know you're you're reducing the soundboard size quite significantly <laughs> by about twenty millimeters on the sides. Wherever you've got an arm bevel, there's a huge block of timber underneath the uh, what they call beachfront real estate. You know, <laughs> like all that this all all that lower bout there is is uh, prime um, tone generation. You know. And, sound generation area so you don't want to lose too much of that so mm -hmm. i try and avoid um using them if i can mm. yeah it's, it's interesting isn't it because i know that from from a stage playing perspective um you know i've never had an, a, a beveled guitar until until recently and um sitting playing it acoustically it's a little quieter than than i mean i've always used smaller guitars anyway i most times I own a dreadnought and I cut out because the same thing, I have a right shoulder problem. So I take yeah, sure. all the guitars. And then once I went to the mm. guitar, which was uh, made by Lou Gebrill, um, uh, again, it just became this complete new comfort zone for my, my shoulder, you know, uh, personally. Mm. Um, and I didn't mind the slight <clears throat> volume acoustically because 99% of the time I was playing it plugged in and into a PA and, at gigs mm. when there used to be gigs. <laughs> mm. it's a bit yeah. Now, but, yeah. Maybe this, my, that's why I've got to move to Queensland so I can still do some gigs. Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, so what kind of, um, I, what I, I should say to the people watching at the moment, look, if you guys out there have got any questions at all, please feel free to uh, throw them up. Um, I'll be happy to kind of, uh, uh, we, can, we can answer as many questions as possible there. Um, <clears throat> what kind of what kind of frets just, uh, you do? You, do you have a tendency to use a particular type of fret, or do you change from guitar to guitar? Um, I, I do change a little bit, and there's there's a lot of features that um, I tend to change depending. <laughs> um, uh, the last few guitars I've been using the Evo Gold Alloy mm. fret wire. Um, I, lo I love the look of it, and um, you know it's a little bit harder wearing than silver nickel. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I haven't tried stainless steel yet, which, you know, is, is another, another level of hardness up. But, um, yeah, I hear it's quite difficult to cut and file and so forth. And I was going to say, you've got to get used to buying uh, fret, fret tangs, uh, fret nippers and all that kind of stuff quite regularly. Yeah. 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 Do, I, I think just, just jumping back to the, um, the arm bevel and so forth, Yep. I, th I think something that I'd really be interested to try, which um, would be much less of a compromise, is the Mansa wedge. You know, um, Linda Mansa um, cre created that wedge-shaped guitar so that the bass side of the oh, guitar yes. is is narrower than the, the treble side. Yep. So that when it's up against your body, it's there's quite a narrow bass um, side um, body width. Yeah, yeah. And um, 
that that still allows you to have a full size soundboard. Yep. You know, and um, I think um, most people are hop- happy to compromise when it comes to a cutaway because the cutaway provides you with so much extra benefit. Mm. You know, a lot of extra benefit with that extra reach. Mm. Um, whereas the the arm bevels are just for comfort, and it depends on your playing style. Like, oftentimes, if you're sitting down, your body is not even touching your arms over the guitar, and it's not really touching the top edge. Yeah, very. So true. it could depend. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I'm very much a stand and play live kind of guy. So, you know, down like mm. it's, a, it's an individual thing. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so Evo Gold Fretwire. Yeah. Evo Gold Fretwire, yeah, nice. And do, yeah, do you yeah. use that on your – because you, you, you seem to be quite influenced by Spanish players. Is, is that fair to say? Um, I, yeah, I'd say very much so. Yeah. <laughs> but to some degree, I guess um, when, I, when I actually started um, on – with. It's backwards, of course. <laughs> That's handy, isn't yeah, it? That's the Making Spain. Master Guitars book. Yeah. Uh, so uh, my, my father's half Spanish, so my, my grandparents were from the north of Spain. Yep. And um, so there were a lot of influences within my life that are Spanish. Um, I grew up here in Australia, don't speak Spanish, but um, <laughs> I, I guess, you know, there's um, an, definitely an interest there and... Um, possibly even the aesthetic of my um, acoustic guitars. Like I uh, prefer a fairly natural and traditional look where uh, the, tim- the tone woods themselves, the colour and the patterns on them actually do all the speaking. I try and keep some sort of aesthetic continuity through them. Yep. Um, as opposed to doing a lot of fancy inlay work, and which, which is fun. You know, but um, at the same time, I, I don't want to detract from the the tone woods that are being used because they are really beautiful. And mm. uh, what we have here in Australia is pretty cred- incredible, you know, yeah. the variety. Yeah, absolutely. So with, with Australian tone woods is, is um, or in tone woods in general, is, is there something you've kind of got on the horizon that you haven't used that you'd like to try? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've, I've, um, th- this particular guitar was, um, originally going to be all Australian tone woods and I have uh, a really beautiful hue and pine top mm. with a uh, bear claw figure all the way through it, top to bottom. It's, it's just incredible. Wow. Um, I think, um, at the time I was pushing to keep the project moving and I had this soundboard that was with you know grain lines um a quarter of a mil apart and extremely tight and i sanded it down to about i think it was 2.7 mil Mm. and the cross grain stiffness was still (laughs) incredibly stiff and uh i'd never come across that before and i decided to put it to to one side just to keep the project moving. Mm-hmm. And I'm still um, really keen to use that. And I think I'll be, you know, it'll probably end up being brought down to something like 2.2 mil uh, with a, a lattice, some kind of um, hybrid X bracing, you know, like Irvin Somogy or something does um, to create that extra stiffness to bring it back into it. Yeah, cool. But, um, the, this particular guitar, actually, um, it's a um, hybrid um, X lattice. So uh, the traditional Martin X brace. Yep. And then the lower bout is um, a really fine spruce, Sitka spruce lattice, which is um, uh, about three mils wide by five mils high. And then it has carbon fibre on the top and the bottom. So it's like a sandwich panel. Yeah, right. So the, you know, the, the weight in the top is drastically reduced. It's quite a thin top as well. Mm. And um, that's definitely produced um, some incredible mobility in that. Mm. Um, but, yeah, as for tone woods, I think um, I've, I've got a, quite a selection of tone woods in the, in the workshop that I've been collecting for a while. Nice. Um, I, I have used um, 
I've got a couple behind me here. I've, I have used uh, Sassafras in the past, and uh, recently I um, listed six on my um, sister site that's called Dos Manos Collective. So I was selling tone wood sets, back and side sets, and four of those sold, and a couple of them are still here. But I think I'll, you know, um, if they don't sell, I've, I've got quite a bit, of, actually, of some other sets and that. But how, do you, um, how do you spell but, that, sorry, for, for your other website? Uh, dos Manos, so D-O-S. Yep. Um, underscore Manos, M-A-N-O-S. Yep. Underscore Collective. Okay. So Dos Manos is like two hands in Spanish. Right, cool. And so it's basically a collection of things that I make that's not guitars. <laughs> yeah, cool, okay. And so um, and through that you, um, you sell wood wood for guitar builders as well uh yeah that's that's correct um just now and then when when i i buy too much tone wood and yeah. i need to sell some of it <laughs> so if there's anyone out there um, kind of watching they can they can look that page up and buy some stuff off you oh man that's beautiful yeah absolutely this is a set Gee, that looks great yeah, there's some, um, so I've got a couple of those sets. And um, this, this is some um, spalted timber that I found at work on, from a pallet. <laughs> and um, due to the colour, no one's probably going to guess what it is. No. It's actually uh, Quila. Right. It's, it's spalted quill or sapwood it's it's quite like it's strong yep. so that'll probably that'll end up um in a like a, on a headstock yep um for a lighter colored guitar um and just from a typical and palette. yeah it was just from a, a palette that some stock came in <laughs> in on and um and the guys sell decking timber and the palette um had a lot of quilla in it um this this is something i'm really keen to try which is budgeroo it's um it's from it's a queensland timber yeah um it grows around esk so just north of brisbane yep and um it's it's incredibly light and strong and really resonant so I've probably, I've, this would be fretboard and, and bridge material. It so I'd have to design something. So what's it, yeah. what's it similar to in nature, like as a, as a potential similar wood? Or is it quite, it's got its own kind of... Um, that's a good question. Um, it's not as heavy as the, the usual Australian native desert um, timbers that are used for fretboards mm. um it's probably <clears throat> it's probably a lot more like rosewood yeah really maybe a tiny bit denser yeah 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 cool um <clears throat> so i think it's yeah fair, probably fairly similar to that yeah. very light in color you can't really stain it or anything so yeah. it's, it'll have to be something quite light but um yeah i don't know i mean i've got um, a few Australian timbers that I hadn't tried yet that I love to try, like uh, Queensland Cowrie. Mm -hmm. And um, I've got some nice um, silky oak sets here as well, back and side sets. With... The, the silky oak, uh, anything from the oak family is quite, um, yeah. quite beautiful, isn't it? You know, like, uh, it's, yeah. 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 So <clears throat> figuring in it and so forth. And so that other build, yeah, absolutely. The other, the other build you've got there with the bevel. <laughs> yes. You've got, you've got that near you as well, have you? I d oh, no, I don't have that here with me, oh, no. okay, okay. At the okay. moment, yeah. I yeah, sorry. You had something else with you, or did I hear that wrong? Um, just this, no, no, just this one particular guitar. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. sorry, I was yeah. a bit earlier, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, and that's so, cool. So, yeah. No, no that's all right. You got... <laughs> Um, yeah, I was going to say that um, earlier you were asking about um, a Spanish influence. Um, uh, maybe, I'm not sure if you were 
heading in the direction of the guitar players that tend to play my guitars or the style of my instruments or something or I, I think uh, that combination of your name um, and sure. having seen that you've made, you know, some like more, uh, some, you know, classical slash flamenco style guitars, um, mm -hmm. you know, that, that which, <clears throat> which I hadn't seen as many kind of, you know, nylon based kind of string guitar makers around Australia. I know they're out there and I know they're doing things, but. Um, you know, just, there's obviously not as many as that would make dreadnoughts or, you know, uh, uh, or steel strings. And then there's probably, again, there's more that tend to make electric guitars, uh, you know, when, when I'm just kind of basing the, looking at the, the stats of a graph, you know, of what, what I'm, yeah. seeing, I'm looking around. Um, and so I kind of wondered whether there was <clears throat> that, that more traditional influence on you versus, um, you know, going, going for, uh, and we took you down more that, that kind of route of doing the, the Spanish kind of guitars. And yeah, I have noticed a lot, a lot of the players who tend to play your instruments tend to be, uh, kind of Spanish influenced or named. And I, so I kind of wondered whether you had a yeah. uh, pen chart for that. I, I think that, yeah, there might, it, it's, um, might be a bit of a coincidence really. It might just be the, you know, the, the music that I enjoy listening to and, um, Anthony Garcia has been one of my um, biggest muses, so to speak. Uh, early on when I started building, he, he's been helping me for the past 10 years mm. in critiquing my guitars. And um, so I guess my instruments have developed um, with not only his contribution and taste in music and he's he's also um um i mean he's classically trained uh but he does play many different instruments and um does a lot of improvisation work and doesn't mind you know jumping between in stringed instruments at all mm. so um quite talented in that respect but I guess um, his ex from his experience, he was used to playing something that was more of a you know a finger picking style instrument with classical guitar and mm. and so the instruments that I've been making have I've always wanted to maintain something that's more of a crossover where it wouldn't predominantly be a, um, a finger style guitar. It would be you could actually um, flat pick on it as well and and um, still have it to be quite a versatile instrument, you know, not, not um, break up or get all muddy when you started flat picking on it. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think um, some of the builders that I've, I've really um, followed closely and really respect, uh, there's a few in Australia as well, I mentioned later, mm -hmm. um, but in America it's Irvin Somergy. And, um, and, you know, he's had quite a few apprentices as well who build incredible in guitars and mm. uh, the likes of Jason Costell and Michael Greenfield. And, you know, these, these guys, um, they're building guitars that they have so much power. And, um, you know, like they're the Rolls Royce of guitars or Ferrari, yeah. like they they sounds when when these guys play them. They sounds like um, a '67 Mustang, you know. Like they just <laughs> there's so much power there and and um, and and resonance. They're just incredible. Mm. Um, and you know, like um, even even from England, there's Rosie, who's uh, Turnstone Guitars from from England. Mm -hmm. um, she's, she's building very similar instruments. Uh, I don't know where she learned, learned her, um, you know, her vocation from, but um, I understand that she early on, she had some lessons and I don't know where the influences are from, but um, she's building similar instruments. And that's the kind of thing that I've been aiming to do as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I admire those quite a lot. And so, I don't know, I'm just developing my own style at the same time. 
Um, and I think uh, the guitarists that have played my guitars have all said the same thing, you know, like they've each got a lot of character. They're, they're quite responsive. Um, and and uh, um, there's a, a, quite a unique sound to them, you know. Mm. Um, so it's good because, you you know, now I'm, I'm starting to become quite confident and, and comfortable with um, the designs that I've developed and the sounds and uh, what's turning into my sounds, you know, like yeah. creating something for myself. So I, I think what's really exciting is that um, uh, next year in 2022, I'll be uh, building guitars full time. Uh, and um, so... Yeah. yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, I think it's the perfect time where we're actually moving to the Sunshine Coast, yep. um, further away from the border. <laughs> <laughs> and, and um, uh, you know, up until this time, I've building, been building one to two gu guitars a year um, and honing my skills and doing that outside of a full-time job normally. Um, but next year we'll see that change to uh, four guitars every six to eight weeks. Yep. Wow. Is the is the is the projected um, you know turn turnaround? Um, and I'll be outsourcing the finishing work as well, so then I can just focus on the building. Yep. And and using the um, OM. Um, this hybrid lattice brace guitar here is one of my base models. Um, to build on, offering them in, in different, um, you know, budget ranges and uh, and then introducing some new models as well nice. on top of that. Yeah, nice. Yeah, so. And, and so with you, it could, you mentioned finishing there and I also want to uh, put a mental note there for pickups because, yeah, I noticed you've got a preamp in, in uh, that guitar you built for your, your wife. But So I want to talk to you about what kind of preamps and pickups you like. But uh, with you outsourcing your finishes, or whoever that might be, but what kind of finishes have you favoured up till now? Like what kind of kind of like, uh, um, is or that that's changed as well. Um, I when I was furniture making, we learnt the commercial application of of um, French polish and. Um, nitrocellulose which is basically off the spray gun yep. um so um a few coats of shellac and stain or whatever you're wanting to do to the timber and then finishing in nitrocellulose mm. so i was doing that um early on and and then i changed to uh pre-cut lacquer and just decided that i wanted to have a clear finish to um with no shellac just to um, show off the timber mm -hmm. without colouring it at all. Um, and the pre-cut lac is just so toxic and smelly yeah. that I stopped using it. Yeah, good call. Um, and, yeah, um, uh, I decided to explore the use of um, varnishes. Um, it seems to be more and more common, even for boutique makers. If you're building a guitar... Um, that doesn't have a live back, um, so you're not concerned about um, how the finish is going to vibrate, mm. um, then you can use stuff like um, uh, polyurethane and so forth, which dries pretty hard, it's durable. So the back and sides of this instrument are polyurethane, mm -hmm. and the top is actually um, hardened shellac. It's okay. a blonde shellac, yep. so super clear. Um, and the neck is actually shellac as well. It's a hardened shellac also. So um, it's a fairly matte, matte finish on it. Um, super smooth, feels really nice, but still allows the soundboard and everything to vibrate really well. Nice. So um, is, that the, is that the process you're going to kind of, you see yourself moving forward with? I, th I think so, yes. And it, it will really depend on the instrument because yeah. let's say, for example sake, if you're building a flamenco guitar, um, a lot of that instrument's vibrating. Mm. Um, the energy is transferring from the top into the sides, into the back, bouncing back and forth. 
Mm. Um, and traditionally, and I think rightly so, shellac is the way to go. Mm. Um, or something really thin that's flexible. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the same goes for um, even like a steel string or a classical. If the back is live, then um, you might really want to be looking at a more flexible finish. Mm. So it's the same. It's it's really the same with glues and things like I, I use just about every glue, but there's a certain um, area of the guitar where I'm using those glues and there's an application and um, uh, value, you know, in certain processes, like you can't dismiss any of the glues, but there's certain areas you shouldn't use them and some areas it's fine. <laughs> yeah. 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 So when, you say, when you say you use quite a few glues, is, is that just based on the application on, on each part of the guitar or is that really down to... Um, That's say, correct, yeah. So you're using like, uh, maybe hide glues or... Um, uh, yeah, hide glue for, um, for the bridge yep. and, for, and fretboard um, to remove them easily. Um, I've used um, Type Bond Original in the past for both of those with um, very little issue. The, the sound the, doesn't change a whole lot. The, the issue is when you want to remove those, yeah. it can take a little bit of timber with it. Yeah. So the, the hide glue will just release straight away yeah. and then you can scrape it clean and with no damage to the instrument. Mm. But, um, you know, like um, uh, Type Bond Original and even Type Bond 3, you know, one of them's like a, an aliphatic resin and the other one's like a PVA. Mm. Um, so they have different applications. Um, you know, I'll use um, epoxy, like West System, like a laminating, a runny laminating epoxy. For sometimes maybe if I'm, um, I'm putting veneers on the headstock, um, gluing those together or even um, I've started using um, polyurethane glue on the if – I'm, if I custom make my own bindings, um, I'll use the polyurethane glue, which is really highly heat resistant so that when you're bending them, uh, the, the laminations of those veneers won't come apart. Yeah. Um, so you could use type on three as well. Um, it's fairly heat resistant. Um, and, but the type bond original, if you apply, if you keep rebending something and wetting it or whatever, they'll, they'll start to come apart, mm. um, which can get pretty messy. Yeah. 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 And so, so with, um, uh, preamps and pickups, what, what process what what do you use and or what do you tend to favor and um have you <clears throat> used multiple pickups to kind of reach a conclusion or is it something you've just kind of been fortunate enough to stumble on what works for you early in the piece um yeah it's kind of a mixture of those things i'm using uh the the k and k the K&K &K, um, Pure yeah. Mini Passive Picker in, in the, like I've, I've got a few boxes of those and I've been putting those in, into guitars. Mm. Unless um, someone actually wants a preamp and, um, you know, adjustable EQing and so forth, sure. um, they're, they're really a, a really nice pickup. Um, they, give, they give a really clear, natural sound. And so basically it's the three, three little piezo discs uh, that get um, super glued underneath the bridge plane. Yep. Um, so instead of having the strip underneath the saddle um, on the top of the soundboard, mm. um, they're underneath. I found, I found that... Uh... Oh, I'm losing you a little bit, or it might be me. Hopefully it's not me. Oh, I don't know if people can still see me. Um, I think maybe Remy's disappeared there for a second. Uh, if any of you out there have any questions for Remy too, by the way, feel free to type them in and ask him anything you like. Uh, it's always handy. Uh, I'm hoping that it's not me that's causing the problem.
I think we may have lost him. <laughs> um, it's good to see a few familiar names and, and some new names up there as well. Uh, Villa Lobo, hey. I don't know if that's your real name. I always get very confused with people's names on here. Uh, because it, but uh, it's good to see you all there. Again, ask questions. Feel free. I will. Uh, I'm fine. Thank you, Liam. Liam of Bill Gola Guitars telling me I'm fine. Well, I have dressed up for the occasion. Uh, here we go. Remy's coming back. Here he comes. Any minute now. Right. Where is he? Hello. There, he is. there we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's. Um, I think my. It was my internet. Nah, no, I, I, I've, yeah, I've yeah. been, um, yeah, it was some sort of internet connection issue. So I've gone to, I'm in the shed <laughs> um, and I've gone back to, I've gone back to Wi-Fi instead of using uh, my mobile oh. network. Yeah. No, that's, yeah. That's good. Ah, so league is um, just some, that's just something I'd, I think I'd like to, sorry. Yeah. Um, oh, no, I was just going to say that, um, um, you know, before, we can probably go for another hour now, <laughs> but before we do, before we do finish up, um, uh, due to the fact that I'll be where I'll be building instruments full time next year. Um, I'll obviously be reopening my builds calendar. Um, so yeah. So for, for any custom, yeah. Yep. Yeah, for any custom builds, if, if anyone, um, who's been watching tonight uh, is interested in actually getting, you know, a personalised guitar, mm. um, and uh, it can be for many reasons. Sometimes you know you've got niggling injuries like yourself or or my wife, and um, it can really help quite a lot to have a smaller instrument or different scale length, mm. um, something that you don't have to wrestle with. Mm. And um, or you just want something customized to suit your, you know, artistic flair, you know, what, whatever style of music you're playing, mm. um, then, you know, definitely drop me a line, send me an email or get in contact via Instagram or something like that. Yeah, no, that's cool. Yeah. And the good thing with, with something like this, mate, is because when the interview's done, you know, it gets posted up and people can watch it at their leisure, you know, so... Um, yeah. For anyone watching, yeah, anytime, absolutely. You know, they can kind of uh, reach out, which is great. And also for for uh, any builders out there, obviously you've got your um, uh, you know uh, wood sets and stuff that you set your tone wood sets that you sell as well. So um, you know, I guess if they kind of yeah, absolutely. Page, now, now and then. Now and then, yeah. Yeah. But even you know. Now and then, there's some surplus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's also a great thing because uh, just that, that interconnectivity here with um, uh, guitar builders being able to kind of like connect with each other and have a chat about ideas and, and, and learn from each other as well, which is uh, something that I've, I've felt that the, uh, this page has uh, opened up for a few people, which is really good. Uh, I know that a few different luthiers now kind of chat to each other that may, may not have known each other in the past. Oh, absolutely. Uh, which yeah, I made connection with uh, Lee, Lee Guitars yeah. um, a few days ago yeah, and uh, via your website and had a great chat with him. He's such a nice guy. And, he is. And, um, and he's had a million Post some wild videos. He's certainly having a lot of fun. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. He's, he's, he's a great guy. And um, I see that he actually just asked a little earlier, what, what glue do you glue your frets in? Oh, with me? Yeah, me. yeah. He just, he just posted a um, saying, do you glue your frets in? Yeah, I, I, I do. Yeah. And I think it was me that was asking John Parsons when oh, he was... <laughs> Yeah. I think it's so, um, is, um, each week somebody new has to ask the question, you know, do you? Yeah. The same question. Yeah. Um, I, I use, um, type bond. Um, so I'll just put it into a syringe and I just run it into the groove and then press, um, press fit with the call, my frets into, um, the slots. Yeah. Um, Early on when I started building, I'd heard that in America, all of the guys were using, um, um, you know, super glue. Right. That was a nightmare. Oh, yeah, yeah. That yeah. was an absolute nightmare. 
Uh, I, yeah. I understand um, John Parsons mentioning that you could, um, you know, you can wick it in through the, the end of the fret. Let it run down. Which is a fantastic idea. It's probably really, really clean mm. to do that. If, uh, if you haven't got a, a bound fretboard, if you've got a bound fretboard, well, that's not an option because you can't get in through the end. No, that's right. But um, uh, I, I know that um, uh, a, f a friend of mine, Trent, from the Brisbane Guitar Making School, um, tried a f a various different options, and one of the options was to um, epoxy the the frets into the the fret slots as well. And the reason for that is to yeah is to stop. So when you're using um, a water based glue, uh, you're introducing water to the fretboard, right. and so by the time you you fret the entire fretboard, you buckle the fretboard or the neck if the, if it's attached to the neck. Mm. that tension and that water could um, completely throw out the level of your fretboard. So yeah, that's good. Um, ideally what you want to be able to do is, and I guess the other thing about the idea of using epoxy in the fret slot, so you trim off all the tangs on your frets and the fret slot is quite wide and you literally just drop them in, they slide in. Mm and they're epoxied in, and that means, you know, you're, you're potentially eliminating a lot of issues with intonation and stuff like that as well because there's no, there are no voids underneath those frets, mm -hmm. and they're never coming out. <laughs> <laughs> you could heat them out. You yeah, could yeah. heat them out. You can apply heat with a soldering iron or something yeah. like that, but, yeah, yeah. you know. Get um, and pull them out, but yeah. And so yeah, do, yeah. do you tend to... Um, because I've, I've seen some do very, very different uh, uh, techniques here. But do you fret before you um, glue the board down onto the neck or do you fret afterwards once the fret board's on the guitar? Um, I, I've done it. I've tried many different options as well. And um, for the last few guitars, I've been uh, fretting on the bench. Mm-hmm directly underneath my fret press and I leave, um, I leave the 12th fret out and the first fret out and I use those as indexing points for my neck. Yeah, and okay. so um, it just means that when everything's glued down and I have a gluing coil that's like a, you know, a little snake, um, everything pulls down really tight Mm. And then uh, pull the index, indexing pins out and clean up those fret slots and drop the frets, you know, the frets in. Um, the, the fret over the body join, if it's the 12th or the 14th, is really easy to knock in with the hammer. Yeah. Because, you know, it's, it's over something solid. Um, and I haven't, the, uh, so the last OM guitar, um, I used that method and uh, the fretboard was virtually completely flat. Like I checked every flat fret afterwards mm. and um, there was a little hump at the body fret yep. and I cleaned that up and I didn't have to touch anything. I didn't have to file any frets down or level the fretboard. Well, and you, want, you really want to avoid doing that on a brand new guitar. You just... You just want it to work, hey. You just, <laughs> well, to, you know, and just yeah, to get that extra life out of the frets for one, and then, but just to save yourself that process of time too. Like, you know, don't get me wrong, I, I love, yeah, absolutely, I love, I love uh, fret filing and stuff like that. But yeah, when you're kind of doing it all the time, it's it's, uh, you know, I know when I used to get customer repairs in, if it was a bunch of fret jobs, you'd you'd eventually get to that point where you're like, oh goodness, can't somebody just give me a basic restring for a few days to something change what the body's yeah doing, definitely what you're physically doing yeah um i know you mentioned earlier um, um uh influences like with uh some of your overseas influences um and you mentioned you had a couple of uh, some australian uh, influences as well is there some people that kind of stick out to you in particular whether it's players um or builders? yeah absolutely um so trevor gore and gerard gillet hey. um and i I purchased their books okay, yeah, a few yeah. years ago. Um, so the Contemporary Acoustic Guitar 
build and design. And um, they're fantastic. Um, you may have seen them before. Um, it's definitely, um, they're definitely like the science aspect of guitar mm. building. Mm. And Trevor's engineering background uh, means that the, the books are really beautifully laid out. They're, they're fairly logical and easy to follow. And then, um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, uh, there, are, there are a few makers, you know, like uh, Luke Calquis here in Brisbane and um, uh, Trent and Andrew from the Brisbane Guitar Making School mm -hmm. and um, um, building some great instruments. Mm -hmm. um, and friends, uh, Doug Eaton from Sunshine Coast uh, builds yep. a variety of, he's retired now, but he's, he built a lot of folk instruments yep. um uh guitars and lap steels lap steel guitars and violins and things as well and baroque guitars yeah wow. um yeah uh graham long um so some of these guys uh there's a handful of guys that have been following i was part of the australian association of musical instrument makers <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> a, a long name. Um, yeah. And uh, they're not running now, but um, uh, before there was a guitar making school here in Brisbane, um, which showed up about six years ago with Andrew, he started that. Uh, there was really nothing in Brisbane. Um, and the um, association was the group that I joined to better understand string instruments and so forth. And towards the end, I was the editor of their magazine. The journal um, came out every um, three months, quarterly. Yep. And uh, I would basically write and edit. It was just a tiny little journal. Um, but it was a lot of fun to do, writing about, um, you know, different instruments and mm. um, travelling to see these people and going to their homes and, and checking out their workshops and, and how they do things. And it was a lot of fun. So, yeah. Yeah. So, the, yeah, there's a, there's a handful of makers like that as well. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, look, the, there are quite a few builders in Australia that um, are quite talented. Um, and uh, I think I mentioned Graham Long earlier for um, – up north here in Queensland, um, and he he has a similar aesthetic as me in the sense, like I really appreciate what he's doing with his builds because he keeps things very natural. Mm. Um, you know, he do, he's he's um, presenting beautiful tone woods to their full potential, mm. um, and uh, his combinations are really nice. The instruments sound incredible, and um, and that's you know that's what I aspire to as well. So there's a lot of a lot of Australian builders that are um, that are helping me in a sense just by me following them and <laughs> yeah. you know seeing what yeah. they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it sounds like a definitely. And and guitar uh, players. Sorry. And guitar players as well. Like I I I think predominantly um a lot of my instrument um my inspiration comes from the players themselves mm. um so um and it's kind of a revolving door like i i research instrument makers to get ideas and and how to do things and then i find that these incredible players are playing their instruments and then i start following these players and then i find that they're playing other people's instruments <laughs> you <Yeah>. know <it's, laughs> It's wonderful, yeah. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, we're pretty blessed in this day and age to be, uh, or maybe even slightly cursed, to be to be overwhelmed with information and access to, you know, just, just endless amounts of builders and players and, and uh, influences of all sorts. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, um, yeah. Apart from um, Anthony Garcia. Um, who's helped me a lot here in Brisbane. Um, there's, uh, you know, Jordan Brody, 
um, another young acoustic guitarist in, in Brisbane here is really accomplished and he teaches and he's, he's been touring and um, he plays some fantastic guitar. Mm. Um, Van Larkins. Oh, Van Larkins. Um, he's, he's a wizard. He's a yeah, wizard he's on the great. guitar. Yeah. Um, and uh, Michael Fix and, um, you know, my friend Nelson Mansilla. Um, plays in Mar Mad Mariachi band here in Brisbane and, and a number of bands. He just, you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, who else? Um, some locals like Andre Reginato and um, Philip Griffin. And a lot of overseas players as well, like, you know, Tony McManus and Tony Palacastro, fairly young, young guy on the scene, accomplished guitarist there. And yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm constantly blown away by these guys that they look all of 15, 16, often younger. And, and they're just yeah. enough I don't think I could ever fathom possibly doing these days, you know, because maybe I'm just stuck in the day. The, 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 the years of playing covers music for a living is, and my, my, my way of putting food on the table has maybe restricted me somewhat, uh, you know, because you can only play horses and stuff like that so many times but um, yeah you know i see some of these young players out there now and, and and they're just constantly pushing the boundary and i suppose that's the thing with uh with builders as well you know you you, you kind of think you've seen it all and then somebody comes up with something somewhere that still makes you go yeah like, absolutely oh, where'd, where'd that come from you know like um, yeah because it's like yeah. everyone takes their influences and just because i want to be i want to do something just that little bit different you know, and uh, yeah, so you see a lot of that out there, which is really cool. And now, so look, we're gonna. Um, I'm obviously gonna have to because uh, we're. On, I'm on a bit of a timeline here as well, and I also respect your time. Uh, as you said, absolutely I'm sure we could very, very easily talk for another hour. Um, but <laughs> very, very, very excited to hear about your shift out into going full time next year. I think yeah, that's that's an amazing Same here. step. And uh, I wish you all the best with that. And again, we reiterate to anybody. Thank you so much. If you're looking at getting a guitar built, touch base with uh, Remy and have a chat, you know, like uh, see whether there's a bit of a connection there for you both and, and how that works out. And um, again, mate, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you to everybody who's joined. No worries at all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, you for uh, inviting me on the show. It was a lot of fun. Absolutely. It's pleasure. been great yeah. chatting and yeah. Uh, too good. Making the and, connection, and like it's anything, good. We'll, we'll finish talking and you'll go, oh, yeah, I forgot to talk about this and that and all that kind forgot. of stuff. But, <laughs> but I just say to people, head on over to uh, Remy's page, Garcia Guitars, and uh, check out his stuff, go through his history and have a look and watch some of the videos of his guitars being played as well. There's some great stuff there. So, yeah. Yeah, and congratulations to you too. I see that uh, you had an interview, um, oh, which I haven't, I haven't finished watching yet. I just started watching that. Yeah, yeah, with, with um, who was Guitar Speak podcast? Yeah, 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 yeah. Very fortunate. Yeah, there's no video because he poor poor Matt would have had a lot of editing to do there. We spoke for a couple of hours just uh, as I was sitting oh, in wow. my car, middle of nowhere. Uh, Matt's a great guy. Yeah, man. he he is he is that podcast of his is brilliant, and he he has exposed me to Australian guitar players I'd never heard of, and just some other stuff that was just. Uh, some of his interviews with mm -hmm. builders in earlier days but it was just great you know so it's um yeah his podcast is great and i felt very honored to be on his show it was very good yeah 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 i can imagine it's fantastic Excellent. well all thank right, you mate. so thank much you. thank you and all the best thanks to thanks to everybody for for tuning in you can see people clocking off there <laughs> yeah yeah they're all right, all right. time for a drink <laughs> yeah yeah right, see you later thank you pleasure Bye. see you later